Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Unseen under the sea lie long seams of coal, one of the largest deposits in the country. In the 1920s, the extraction and exploitation of this wealth led to an epic struggle between the miners of Cape Breton and the British Empire Steel Corporation of Montreal. Today, there are still 3,000 men who dig coal under these waters, but there were once 12,000. The favorite miner was endangered. He was plucky. He had lots of guts, eh? And he stood up for his right. I've seen men who had to get their cans filled by other men. They helped one another as much as they possibly could. They helped one another. This has been done That's over been there going time on and again. Since the, since the early 20s, since, since they could afford social, it. Uh, social yeah. assistance was out. <laughs> <laughs> People want to uh, say Cape Britain is this or that, and uh, they're still the best people in the world. Let's go down at the back, sir. <laughs> the fight of the 20s is best remembered in Cape Breton by the killing of miner William Davis by company police on June the 11th, 1925. The miners have never worked on June the 11th since then. Instead, they pay tribute to the memory of Davis and the many hundreds of men who have lost their lives in the coal mines of Cape Breton. First street would be the Davis family. Large-scale industrial capitalism came to Cape Breton in the 1890s, when most of the island's 30 small mining companies were merged into one large monopoly called the Dominion Coal Company, invention of Boston financier H.M. Whitney. He obtained from the liberal government of Nova Scotia a 99-year lease on the richest Cape Breton coal fields. With this rich supply of coal, with iron ore nearby in Newfoundland, and a good deep water port in Sydney. Whitney then had no trouble in getting generous government support for a steel plant, which opened in Sydney in 1901. Hereafter, declared Whitney, my life and work will be one with the people of Sydney. Within a year, he sold both the steel plant and the coal mines to a group of Montreal and Toronto financiers. Cape Breton entered the 20th century as one of the cornerstones of the industrial boom that swept Canada with the building of the railways. On the eve of World War I, the production of coal was three times higher than it had been when Whitney arrived. And the population of industrial Cape Breton had more than doubled to 75,000 people. The promise of work brought men from the countryside of the Maritimes, from the oak ports of Newfoundland, from the coal fields of Britain, France, and Belgium, and from the villages and farms of continental Europe. Booming towns like Glace Bay, New Waterford, Duncan, and Sydney Mines were producing almost half of Canada's coal. And within these towns, Cape Breton coal miners developed a strong sense of community solidarity and working class consciousness. It was based on a hatred for the shifting absentee owners and their local managers, the harsh conditions of work in the mines, the poverty level of pay, and the traditions of Scottish culture and labor history.
Wood Avenue, New Waterford. In these houses, the pioneer spirit of that age can still be found. How are you, Paul Parker? Oh, Agnes. How are you? Too bad. You haven't changed your gold earned bit. Well. Happy to see you again. Look well, boy. Yeah. I was surprised to hear that you were living. I thought you were gone. Oh, Lord. Oh, mate, they're not ready for me yet, mate. Not ready yet. Not ready. Uh, I guess you were as old as I am. Hey, I'm 82. 82. You're two years of me. Hey. I'll be 80 next month. Hey. Well, we pretty near went to the same school, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> or ABCs, but we're doing the same. <laughs> well, I had grade four, Mickey. What did you have? Uh, grade six. Oh, you're way ahead of me. You're, you're an academic. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you went to the pit as young as I did. I went in the pit, uh, went uh, traveling with the deputies when I was uh, about 13 years old. Same as myself. Yeah, I went to number three. Number three down at the... Uh... Race Bay, yeah. Yeah, the way. Yeah, that's where it started, 1908. Oh, yeah. 13 years old. What did you get a day, Mickey, when you were down there? Which day did I get? 65 cents? Uh, 65 or 75 cents. 65 something like that. cents. 65, 65 cents, something like that. Trapping a door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's terrible way to think of it, eh? are very independent. They uh, run the mines. They're away from uh, the environment. They're not brainwashed. They're not uh, imposed upon as they would be on the surface. And uh, they're defying um, the elements underground, danger, collapse of roof colds, fire, gas explosions, dust explosions. But my father met with an accident. He lost with both eyes, part of his hand. Yeah. 1919. He got $55 a month now for 10 children home. That's the amount he got for it. Losing his eyesight and half of one hand. He come through and he lived for a long time after that. That's well, all he got out of it. Just stayed home. That's when I had to go to work then in 1921. If they did, I'd have been in. To help keep the house. You worked 12 hours, I guess, when you started first. 12 when I first started, 12 hours a day. Some days in the coal mine, you'd be wet from daylight until dark. Well, from the time you'd go in out, you'd go home. You'd be soaking wet, you know. Dampness in the ground, in the underground, and probably you'd be in a wet place, and soaking wet all day long. <laughs> Now, they didn't ca carry on for probably months and months. Yeah, well, there was no such a thing as unemployment insurance at that time. Yeah, you, you kept your place in shape and your mind in shape in order that it was going to work, and that was your livelihood. <laughs> and those men, they went in there and they'd mine that thing so excited. They bore that things and they kept the ribs straight. They had to timber nicely, you know. They were proud of their place. In fact, when they sit down with a glass of rum, how is your room? How are you doing with your room? Oh, you want to see my room? And the other one, mine is better than yours. And, and if they're in the same section, they could walk in to make fun of one or something, wouldn't they? Yeah. Or have their breakfast with them, break the cans with them, eat together. But today, you have that damn big machine going, you know what I mean. With the fellow behind it is quite happy because He's working all right, but when it stops, he don't care. It'll stop. I wait till it starts again. And then when three o'clock comes, I'm up. You see? But if you were in the pillars or rooms or narrow work them days, and you didn't get your coal out, if you didn't get your 10 or 12 or 15 tons a day, you didn't get a payday. And then you'd work like hell to get that amount of money. I'd say the older miners had more pride in their work. It was trade. Yeah. It was a trade then, Joe. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was a trade. Coal mining was a trade then. Yeah. They used to pick at that time, not the machines. They can shop. When they go down there and could go, come home about five o'clock, I think they needed to rest. And if I, I had a crowd of children, all right, but if I was tired, I could sit down. They were going to shove me around and say, get your work done. Uh, so I think the poor miners, they really had it hurt. But I because say the, both men and women worked hard because we had to work hard to keep the what? keep the coal dust down. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, we had to do all that work. But what I mean, what I mean, if it wasn't done today, and we say we'll we'll do it tomorrow, well the miners couldn't do that. They had to do it today, and tomorrow was another day. It's a question of survival, the question of living. They have to work. You have to go out early. You have to strain your guts all day to to make a small day's pay. And uh, that militancy becomes part of your bone and blood and muscle, you see. We meet today in freedom's cause and raise our voices high. We'll join our hands in union strong to battle or to die. Hold the fort, for we are coming, union men be strong, side by side we battle To take on a monopoly the size of Dominion Coal Company, the miners needed a union the size of the United Mine Workers of America, which had been able to win the eight-hour day for American miners. Cape Breton miners organized District 26 of the UMW in 1909 and had to strike immediately to win recognition from the company. After a struggle of 10 bitter months, the new union was crushed by the combined forces of the Dominion Coal Company, the provincial government, the courts, and the Canadian army. Most of the organizers of that strike were blacklisted from the mines for the rest of their lives. Many of them left Cape Breton to find work out west or in the States. But some stayed home to keep the UMW alive and to start organizing a workers' party. One of them was a graduate of the militant coal unions of the Scottish Lowlands, a man called James B. McLaughlin. I'm going to speak as I feel about McLaughlin, boy. McLaughlin was a, a courageous, a good, honest, straight labor leader. Indeed he was. I, uh, I think McLaughlin was about the, one of the best labor leaders that ever was in Nova Scotia. On the eve of World War I, with the company in control, the miners' working and living conditions were deteriorating, and their low wages were not keeping pace with rising prices. The war changed everything. two brothers killed in that war. I listed myself and I was turned down. Like my brother, for instance, he won the pit when he was 14. Well, he'd never been out of here, you know, never had a chance to uh, move out. And uh, he was only one of the thousands like him around the mining communities around Cabretton Island. And uh, adventure like, uh, let us get into this thing and get out of here. You know, get out of the pit and uh, we'll come back alive sometime. We'll come back sometime. home, Cape Breton coal miners were working at breakneck pace to meet the fuel needs of the war machine. On July 26, 1917, disaster struck at New Waterford.
Minnie, she says, an explosion on number 12 pit. She says, my Lord God, with that, I dropped everything and I won. Uh, there were 69 men killed. I yeah. Tied. And you couldn't get my picture in, but the crowd that was there. Yes, they had to tell them push back. I catch the gas to come up and, and might catch some of them. The woman of the next end, she had a little boy, 15. His father asked me to go down. They didn't know for sure because his father was working at 16. And I went down, but I didn't come back to tell her that he was killed. Oh, they had a lovely big funeral. I was at their funeral. Five of them were buried in one grave. Five of them. The coroner's jury charged the company with gross neglect in enforcing safety standards. They were exonerated, as per usual. Is any wonder that young men would want to get away, get out of this, and face the guns over in, the, over in Germany? then face that condition here. You know what I mean? That was here, in this civilized country of ours. We grew up in that. And we had to try to abolish that uh, system and that sort of thing. See our numbers still increasing here, the bugle blow. By an union we shall triumph over every foe. Outraged at the high profits and low wages of war, the miners of Cape Breton got themselves reorganized. By the end of 1920, they had won recognition of District 26 of the United Mine Workers, the eight-hour day, and a return to the wage level they had lost 15 years before. They had also elected labor representatives to their town councils and to the Nova Scotia legislature on a platform which called for the nationalization of banks, utilities and natural resources, democratic control of industry, abolition of the standing army, and a guarantee of the material necessities of life. Just a, a, a logical result of oppression, wage slavery, of poor conditions, of uh, class relationships, One's got it all, the other's got nothing. The uh, impoverished miner against the absentee coal owners. Now that the war was over, the absentee owners were in trouble. Their traditional markets in central Canada were now being invaded by surplus coal from the United States. Just when the industry needed good management, Cape Breton coal fell into the hands of a group of financiers led by Roy Milhouse Wolven of Montreal. They bought out all steel and coal companies of any size in Nova Scotia and merged them with a collection of lumber and sawmills, ship lines and shipyards to form the largest industrial consortium in Canada at the time. They called it BESCO, the British Empire Steel Corporation based it on watered stocks and determined that the whole flimsy structure would be held together by profits from Cape Breton coal. Roy Wolven declared war on the miners in 1922 by announcing that their wages would be cut by one-third. The miners were now ready to put up a fight. District 26 called for the complete overthrow of the capitalist system and shut down the mines for the first time since 1909. This time, the towns and the union solidly united to organize relief and to police incoming traffic for strike breakers and illegal liquor. Fifteen hundred federal troops were sent in, prepared for battle, but found only order and calm, and soon started fraternizing with the strikers. J.B. McLaughlin had been elected secretary treasurer of District 26 the day the strike began. He used to get up, <coughs> bang the table, and bang his knees, and gentlemen who said this British Empire Steel and Coal Corporation, do you know how much money they got? 
And you took a whole lot of dollar bills, dollar, dollar pieces, that big, you said. And you started in Sydney. And you laid it one by one from here to Vancouver and back again. He says, you, they still have a pile left. And that's what you boys got to go after, is to get this money. <laughs> The miners went after the company so effectively that the Nova Scotia government was forced to intervene. Within two weeks, the wage cut was reduced by half. Roy Wolven called this a concession to the Bolshevists and threatened that grass would grow in the streets of Sydney unless the radicals were driven out of Cape Breton. The Liberal government of Nova Scotia derived one-third of its annual revenue from coal royalties. It supported Wolven by setting up a special police force of a thousand men. It wasn't long before Premier E.H. Armstrong had a chance to use his army. At the Besco Steel Plant in Sydney, 3,000 men worked 11 hours on the day shift, 13 hours on the night shift, seven days a week, yet faced repeated layoffs and wage cuts, like the miners. Unable to win union recognition, they walked out in the summer of 1923. On Sunday, July the 1st, Armstrong's army tried to intimidate the strikers by attacking them and their families on their way home from church. Within two days, 8,000 miners struck to demand withdrawal of the provincial police and the federal troops now flooding into Cape Breton once more. No man can remain at work while this government turns Sydney into a jungle. To do so is to sink your manhood and to allow Armstrong and that miserable band of grafting politicians to trample your last shred of freedom in the sand. This call for a political strike earned McLaughlin two years in Dorchester Penitentiary on a charge of seditious libel, with Premier Armstrong's own Attorney General acting as Chief Prosecutor. But what really broke the strike of 1923 was the headquarters of the Union in Indianapolis, where President John L. Lewis was in his first term of office. On learning of McLaughlin's arrest, he wired, I am familiar with the constant intrigue between yourself and your revolutionary masters in Moscow. The United Mine Workers of America cannot be used to strike down the established institutions of government. I hereby advise you that the Charter of District 26 stands revoked and that you are automatically deprived of your office. A lot of these, that society, that part of society was against the people, against the workers, because they want to hold that structure for themselves as it was. You know what I mean? Don't interfere with this. This is the way it is. This is the way it's going to be. And anybody who starts to change this thing will handle you right. And that's why they handled Jim McLaughlin. And that was only to throw the fear into others that might attempt to do that. Uh, don't you run anybody before Parliament. Don't do this. Leave us alone. And you fellas just go down the pit and dig coal and uh, we'll, we'll be all set here. That's what the story is. Forced back to work without a settlement, the miners and steelworkers now had to face a corporation whose shares were plummeting on the distant stock exchanges. They had to make do with never more than two days' work a week, and often with none. For home fuel, they opened their own bootleg coal mines, wherever the coal seams crept close to the surface. For food, only charity, union funds, and credit at the company stores kept Cape Bretoners from dying of starvation. In the gloom of mighty cities, mid the roar of whirring wheels, we are toiling on like chattel slaves of old. And our masters hope to keep us ever thus beneath their heel, and to coin our very lifeblood into gold. But we have a glowing dream, just how fair this world would seem. When each man can live his life secure and free When the earth is owned by labor And there's joy and peace for all In the commonwealth of toil that is to be 
Concerned only to maintain profits, the company announced another wage cut in March 1925 and this time tried to break the miners' resistance by cutting off credit at the company's stores. The miners took the challenge and struck once again. Almost as soon as they were out, Besco Vice President J.E. McClurg declared, It's a game of poker. We hold the cards. Things are getting better every day they stay out. Eventually they'll come crawling to us. They can't stand the gaff. The sympathy of the whole country now turned to the strikers. Relief poured in, even from John L. Lewis, and the miners stood the gaff for three months. The climax came at the New Otterford power plant, controlled until June by the strikers. On the night of June 10th, the company sent in a squad of police to take it back. The next morning, they rode through the streets of New Waterford loudly proclaiming their victory. A few hours later, 800 miners and their wives marched the three miles out to Waterford Lake, determined to take back control of their town's power and water supply. With William Davis dead and five others wounded, the miners and their wives fought back with their bare hands. Running for their lives, many of the police plunged into the lake and escaped through the woods. The remainder were captured, stripped, and marched to the town jail. coming out when the men came out the railroad and then they took up branch off this little path and by this stump Mr. Davis was shot and it was across there that's yeah. what I'm trying to find yeah there's where he was shot you see everything has changed so much right around here yeah here's uh, where the where the uh, power plant was it was boilers that was here and they supplied water for it in the town with the electric lights so they pulled them out on us too we had no lights or no water. It was really terrible. It was horrified because uh, when the word came, when I heard, got the word first, there was a man killed. I just didn't know who, who was the man. And it was a terrible feeling. But uh, I did see the uh, remains of Mr. Davis on the, uh, on the fire truck going home. Still, I didn't know who the man was. And I seen Mr. Watson. He was all covered up with a gray blanket, and I could see his feet. We were, we wasn't, didn't feel too bad about it. We were quite happy, you know, because we conquered them. They were, they were all gone ahead of us. We were coming behind them. <laughs> we took fine care. There were not one man left here. <laughs> what wasn't in the hospital was ready for us. <laughs> oh, my land, it was a horrible day. The coal company wanted to give them a 20% reduction in wages. 10%. 10%. 10% reduction in wages. Yeah. No, they're after 20. We settled for 10. <coughs> Something like that. I think Joe... Uh, this year in and year out before we took office in 1925, there was always a reduction in wages. Yeah. For yeah. the men, from the company. Yeah. Right up to 37.5% reduction in wages. Mm -hmm. So those are things that I don't think should happen. I think the coal industry is making money they're making it in piles and piles and they're investing it in other concerns or in the interest to other people. That's just a, they spent a lot of money in Halifax and in Montreal, which should have went to the workers, in my mind. Yeah, you, know, you got an idea how those companies work. From year to year, you got to improve your the, oh, the balance, yes. the balance sheet. Yes, that's and true. Any of they used to uh, inflate their their uh, <clears throat> their sheets, their profits, 
to show to the uh, to the shareholders. And when they couldn't do that anymore, put any more water into it, <laughs> they had to uh, cut our wages because <laughs> of it was more dividends. We, the men had to suffer. Yeah. They had to suffer. Mm -hmm. We could use it better than they could. <laughs> glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. In July 1925, the Liberal government was swept from office for the first time in 43 years. By August, the new Tory government was able to get the miners to go back to work without a contract, pending the findings of a royal commission. In January, the royal commission denounced the company for poor housing and sanitary conditions, but approved the wage cut. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. There were no victors. In 1926, the rickety financial structure of BESCO began to collapse and Wolven was forced to resign. Not until the Second World War would the miners win back the wages they had lost in 1922. The coal and steel industries of Cape Breton have never regained their earlier prosperity. Drained for so long by private corporations, they had to be taken over by the federal and provincial governments in 1967 in order to keep them alive. Through the unions and through the political movement, we were able to make some changes, but still there's some of it left to be done yet, quite a bit of it. 